today. And only you can decide what you want, what you want this country to be, what you want to do with the future. Vote like your whole world depended on it. Voters should not be forced to go to the polls with their fingers crossed. They understand what peace demands. What America needs are leaders to match the greatness of her people. Campaign appearances are getting closer and closer together as each candidate tries to get in his best shot. Vote. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. It's going to get dirtier in these last few days. No apologies, no regrets. We will not be coerced. We will not tolerate being pushed around. Not sure you heard about this, but we're in the middle of a presidential election here in the United States. I think word is starting to get out about that. And those of us who've been through several of these presidential election cycles, we've experienced the, the range of emotion that comes with it. Some, sometimes it's the elation of victory because your favorite candidate has won. And sometimes it's despair that the enemy is now behind the wheel of the country, about to drive it off a cliff. And uh, sometimes we're somewhere in between. Here's what's coming up in 2016. So both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump have secured the necessary delegates to be their respective parties' nominees for President of the United States. So what comes next? The Republican National Convention will convene in Cleveland the third week of this month, and they will do their thing. The week after that, the, the Democratic Convention will, will meet in Philadelphia. At the conventions, what happens is each party has their formal nominating event for their candidates for president, vice president, likely in the next week or so. We're going to hear about uh, who vice presidential uh, candidates will be. They will have a lot of speeches. They will adopt their party's platforms about this is what we believe, what we stand for, what's important to us. And while it feels like it has gone on for an eternity already because it started uh, well over a year ago, uh, we can expect in coming off of those two conventions, we can expect a series of debates between the candidates, lots of fundraising calls and emails and mailings, and lest the world stop spinning on its, its axis, a nauseating amount of 24-hour news coverage of it all in horrible detail. So, we have that to look forward to. If nothing else in this particular election, we do have this promise. It will not be boring. It's going to be tabloid news good every day, I think, is... We go into this one. Now, since early on in the primaries, there's been a theme, and it has run through both parties as they focused on completely different issues, but the theme is fear. Be afraid. Be very afraid. The world is about to end. It is, I think the theme has caught a lot of people, too. There's a great deal of despair a sense of desperation, all hope is lost, America is circling the drain, evil is triumphant, and woe is me. And we've seen it not just as a national phenomenon, but as an international phenomenon. The vote in Great Britain uh, just over a week ago, that was a big deal. And it, it was largely marked by the fears of the population. And there are plenty of geopolitical issues wrapped around it, but that was a big deal. Then in the last week, we've had a major bombing at a significant hub airport in Turkey. Uh, there was a big terrorist attack yesterday in Bangladesh where uh, s scores lost their lives. And today, because they're eight hours ahead of us, today in Baghdad, uh, now estimating close to 150 people in an ISIS-related coordinated bomb uh, attack uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 people maybe, uh, or 250 people killed or wounded. And it's a, it's a weird world. And fear is definitely a part of what we, what we feel. So here we are in a presidential election year, and I've heard this question asked, I think, more this election cycle than ever before. The question is, uh, so am I, 
am I forced to just have to vote between the lesser of two evils? Do you ask yourself that question? Or the evil of two lessers. You could do it either way. Uh, but the, the lesser of two evils. And, you know, to that question, I'd just say this, that, uh, and I've voted in several presidential elections now, and here's my experience. In fact, from presidential elections all the way to electing the, the simplest of local officials, you have never voted. If, you're a, you, if you've voted ever, you have never voted for anything but the lesser of two evils. You know why? Because unless Jesus Christ is on the ballot, you're always voting for a sinner. Because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that's just going to be a part of the process for you. So you're always going to vote for someone who is a flawed individual. Now, we say that. We recognize the brokenness, the sinfulness of the world around us. However, that does not relieve us of responsibility to still exercise our vote and to do that well and with great discernment. So you don't turn a blind eye to the people that you are seeking to, to place in office. So it would be the same thing as, uh, well, by God's standard and God's word, we are all liars. Every one of us in this building is a liar. You, you have done dishonest things. You have done something that breaks the, you shall not, you shall not lie. And if you, if you deny that, you're just denying God's word. But that doesn't mean that you should say, well, my response to that is, well, if I'm hiring somebody to work for me and... They're just a habitual liar, and it's obvious to everybody. Well, you know, everybody's a sinner, so I'm going to go ahead and hire them. Well, no, use some discernment. You don't pull, pull in someone who really is a big-time liar. You just recognize there's a character flaw in everyone. The Bible says that if you lust in your heart after someone, you've committed adultery. And, okay, well, that, that's going to open up a, a wide, and that's what Jesus said, so that opens up a wide definition of what adultery is. However... If a young woman is about to marry a young man who already has a pretty good visible, tangible, measurable track record of uh, adultery, fornication, she should probably have exercise and discernment to say, well, there may be a better choice than that guy. So with our candidates, you're not going to have a perfect candidate in anything that you're going to ever vote for, and certainly not in a presidential election where so much is laid bare and we, we, we learn a lot. We'll learn plenty more between now and November, I have a feeling. We have a responsibility. The 2016 election is, uh, is being shaped by fear. And I want to tell you this. While fear might motivate the unbelieving masses, it should not shape how believers think about their world or think about the electoral process. The words fear not... That little phrase is used over and over and over again. In Old Testament, in New Testament, those inspired words come from a God who He knows our frailties. He knows our weaknesses. He knows how vulnerable we are. He knows that there are times when there are things to be afraid of. But that does not drive the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has conquered all things, creating human fear. The, the, the Word of God sets up, this, sets up this tension between fear and faith. And here's how it works. That they are polar opposites, and when fear rules, faith fails. And when faith rules, fear falls. God, as a follower of Jesus Christ... The declaration of God's word is God holds the future in his hands. And it fills believers with courage to be on mission for God even when the world seems really, really dark. I am treading on thin ice in everything I'm about to say today. I recognize it is countercultural and it's counter to a lot of what you have heard in Christian circles. But I think there's a lot that's been said in Christian circles that's not particularly Christian or biblical. And so we're going to work on that some today too. And you can hate me all you want because I'm not going to be here next week. I'll be in Tanzania. <laughs> and based on how you listen to sermons, you'll probably forget what I said by the time I get back anyway and everything will be good. Here's what I want to say. Governments, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a biblical theologian by training. My backup part of my education, I'm a historian. I will knock down several 
I've, I've knocked down thousands of pages of, his, of history this year already. I'm halfway through the year. I'm, I'm into the several thousand pages of history books. I love history. I'm a student of history. And here's what I've learned about history and as a theologian. Governments will fail. Economies will crumble. Moralities will shift. But Jesus remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the truth of God's Word. Now, when the news cycle is going to deliver daily news of the realities of a fallen world, and I turned on the television this morning and went through three different news stations as they talked about everything that's broken, everything that's wrong, everything that's bad. Christians have a Savior in the middle of that kind of storm that whispers a word of peace and calm storms. That's our Savior. Now, no one knows who's going to win this uh, upcoming presidential election. You follow the polls now, and there are multiple polls being released on a daily basis, and it's, it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with these two candidates every day. So uh, it'll be fun to watch as it goes along. Uh, here's what we do. As followers of Jesus Christ, we fulfill our responsibility as citizens. We live in a country where we have the opportunity to vote, and we absolutely should vote. And as an informed voter, I'm going to vote in every election that comes along. I'm going to vote in every small local election. I'm, when, 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 in our state elections, we often have uh, amendments to that crazy Texas Constitution, and it's complicated to understand what those things are, but I'm going to research it, and when I walk in, I'm going to know the pros and the cons of what that thing is, and I'm going to, I'm going to vote as an informed voter. And I'm not just going to wait for every four years when I'm voting for a president. I'm going to know what's going on with all those representatives at the state level, at the national level. We're going to vote on a lot of stuff besides just a president this year. So be informed as a voter. And then for me, I love my city. I love my community. I want to seek its welfare. I want to care about the people that are within the reach of my influence and certainly within the reach of this church's influence. And I want to represent Christ well in that. Seek, as the Bible tells you, seek the welfare of your city. I want to work for the common good, but I'm not going to do that out of fear. I'm going to do it with joy because I'm going to look well beyond this election cycle. Whatever happens... I'm not living and dying by what happens the first week of November in the United States of America. Because I, I live here, I cherish my citizenship here, but I want to tell you something. I'm not from here. My citizenship is there. I'm a dual citizenship guy. My citizenship is in heaven. And my primary allegiance overwhelmingly always is going to be to Jesus Christ. Whatever happens in the United States of America. So on we go. Now, I want you to open your Bibles to the faith chapter in the Bible. This is, this is Hebrews chapter 11. By the way, every little Bible driller, when they're, learn, they're going to learn, they'll, they'll know exactly. If I said faith chapter, they'd all open the Bible. Wouldn't they, Taryn? They'd all go right to Hebrews chapter 11. It's the faith chapter. You need to know stuff like that. Well, it's, it's a great, great history of God's people in a, as a people of faith. And we're going to jump in. At verse 8. This, verse 8, 9, and 10, about 17 years ago, we spent a lot of time with those verses. We talked about them almost every Sunday. And the reason we did is because it formed the, the foundation for how we talked about building this building and what it was going to take to build this facility, this worship center. And uh, we called the effort to build it from the from the giving part of it to the planning part of it, growing faith and foundations. And so we, we talked a lot about these three verses. So here we go. This is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. In that passage, uh, something of interest to you maybe, verse 9 is the only place in the Bible where the land of Canaan is called the promised land. We often talk about it as the promised land. That's the only place where that name shows up in, in that particular verse. It's the promised land, the land of promise. But here's the interesting part of that promise. 
Abraham, the heir to the promised land, didn't own it. Here's what the Bible says in Acts 7. But God gave him no inheritance, the here, not even one square foot of land, the New Living Translation says. The only thing he ever owned in the promised land was a burial plot that he bought for his wife when she died. He bought a cave, and he, that was the place where he placed her body, and that's the only thing. He paid for that out of his pocket at full price, the Bible says. That wasn't a part of the promise of God to him. So here's the idea. of Here's Abraham, and he is receiving this promised place, this land. Ken Hughes said it would be like if, if you and your descendants, God said, I am giving to you the land of Guatemala as your promised land. And you went there and you lived in a camper and you, you moved from campsite to campsite. You and your sons and their families and your descendants and you were just constantly moving around. You live there. It's a wonderful place to live. But you don't have roots there. You're not digging down there because... Because there's another land that you're looking forward to in the promises of God. The application here is that people of faith, I want you to, here and now, this, America is a wonderful country. Man, I'm so glad. I, I, one of those things, I won the lottery when I was born in the United States. Out of all the places you, know, you could be born, this is what an incredible country. But just so you know, in case you weren't sure about this, this is not the promised land. This is not the land of God. That land yet awaits us. This is not the place of perfection. This is not the place where it's always going to be all about Jesus. That's the place where it's always going to be. This is not heaven. So if you weren't sure about that, then by the way, I, I, this last week I was writing a sermon for this series of doctrinal things. I wrote a sermon about hell, and I was trying to figure out in July, how do you motivate people about hell when they live in Texas in July? It's just not frightening enough. So I had to, had to work at that just a little bit more. It'll be terrifying when you hear it, by the way. Uh, and that's just a bonus thing from me. Here's, here's why I say that. The, we, the biggest false teaching in these United States of America, I, I think it's the biggest, the biggest, certainly, you can, you can go to a wealthy first world country like this and you find it, and you can go to a third world country in Tanzania, and we will find it next week. The health and wealth gospel that says, man, it's heaven on earth right now. It's your best life now. Everything's going to work out right now. That God's plan for your life is always that it just goes just the way you want it to, and it's always going to, the, the chart's always going to be up and to the right, and everything's going to be great. And uh, God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and everything to be wonderful all the time. And that, Karen told us a minute ago, that's just not how it works. That's not how God has shaped this thing up. This is not heaven right now. That health and wealth gospel is popular out there, though. Here's what the Bible says. It says God's people are going to face tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Paul described himself this way in 2 Corinthians 6, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. Abraham lives as an alien in a foreign land, dwelling in tents. Uh, he stands in contrast to his nephew Lot. You remember the story? You got Abraham, his nephew Lot. They both have a lot of stuff, a lot of cattle, a lot of possessions, a lot of family members, and they just can't be in the same place and and live well. They're, they're fighting over territory, fighting over water. And so they decide to divide up. What happens? Well, Abraham, he keeps moving. He's, he's, not, he's not planting his roots in this land. He's living in it. He's interacting with his neighbors in this land. He's caring for them, but he's, he, he's living. I'm, I'm not a part of this culture. I belong to God. Lot, on the other hand, he moves to Sodom. He's living in a house. He is settled in. He's put down roots. And what happens? His whole family is poisoned by the sin of Sodom. And the, and the repercussions of that continue for generations and generations. Because he dug down and said, my hope is going to be in this culture, in this place, 
this as my primary home. Now, here's what, uh, here's what it would say. When you travel to a foreign country, you, you stand out as different. You, you're not one of them. You, you may temporarily adopt some of their customs so as not to offend anybody, but, but you're not from there, and most things uh, you think and live are just going to be different than the customs of that place you visit because you're from somewhere else. I told the first hour, as I thought about this, as I'm heading back to Tanzania, we were in a different part, a northern part of Tanzania last year, and uh, we had four teams from our church one day, the church I was partnered with, we were going out to share the gospel. And we were going to the same general area, but we weren't together. Well, one of our guys is a deacon in the church. He, he was having to take care of some work stuff, and he left work, and he was trying to catch up to us, and he couldn't, he didn't have a cell phone. The pastor I was with had a cell phone. This guy didn't have a cell phone, so he couldn't call to say, hey, where are you guys? He knew the general area we were sort of going. We were going north. And so he said, we came back to the church after we were all done. He gave this testimony. So, he says, I just started walking. And I knew you'd gone north. So I went to the first intersection. And there were multiple roads in different directions. And he said, I was standing there trying to decide which way to go. And someone said, can I help you? Are you lost? And he said, yes. I'm trying to find my friends, and I don't know where they've gone. And so the guy said, well, what do they look like? And he says, well, uh, there's probably six, eight of them, and, oh, and one of them is a Mzungu. He's a white man. I was the only white man I saw all day in the whole area where I was every day. I was a tourist attraction which is part of what opens the door to the gospel. Is, uh, people are willing to let me come in, and then I've got this team of people from the church, and together we share the gospel. This is uh, Mzungu. He said, oh, they went that way. He knew immediately. So he said, I walk to the next intersection. Again, there's a fork in the road. I don't know where to go. Which way to go? Mzungu. Mzungu went that way. He said, it only took me a few minutes but everyone knew exactly where we were because, because Chad was with me. Uh, when, when you're in a foreign place, you stand out from the crowd often. You're not like they are. You are different from your surroundings. As God's people, our homeland is heaven. And we're just passing through this earth. And man, I know this is the only life that we know. Right now, it's the only, it's, it, it, but we're so tied to it with our stuff and with our hearts are so deeply invested here that we're not seeing there's a whole lot more out there and eternity's forever and ever. Let's get our eyes on some of that. Because when we see ourselves as sojourners, as uh, aliens in this land, our mindset toward success, our mindset toward how we handle our possessions, our, our mindset toward purpose in life is just going to be radically different than the people around us who don't share that relationship to Christ. Natives hope center on this life only. And man, there's so many people that are going to be in church today somewhere that all their hopes and, and everything they're leaning into is about right now. And they are living and dying. And, and their, their happiness or their discouragement is all based on what's happening today and what's happening in their culture around them. And that is not how a follower of Christ should live. Trying to accumulate things, engaging in activities that we think will bring us happiness in this life. But pilgrim's hope center in Jesus Christ. And it centers in our eternal inheritance in Him and Him alone. So, and again, Taryn talked about this. So we hold on to, we hold on to our stuff lightly here. Because this time is passing and it's passing quickly. We enjoy what God has provided. We're thankful to Him for His provisions in this life. But we are storing up treasures for heaven. Abraham, it says in God's Word, was looking for a city which has foundations whose architect and builder is God. In, in the Greek language, there's a definite article in front of foundations. Sometimes it'll say, you know, a foundation is an indefinite article. A foundation. The, there's a definite article. 
there is the foundation, not just one of many options, but there is one way to do this, and that foundation, that foundation's found in our Savior. The city with foundations stands in contrast to life in a tent that has no foundation. See, God is both the architect and builder of this city with foundation that is solid and secure, the heavenly places that await the people of God. Next Sunday, I'll, I'll be preaching in a little church in Tanzania, and I've been preparing for months, and you know, the one thing I haven't done is I haven't packed even one thing so far, and I assume I'll need something. So uh, pray for me in that. It's the hardest part of going. Being in Tanzania is easy. Getting there is terrible for me. So i was been thinking about Tanzania, praying about it for over a year, and then I came across this blog article a few months ago, and it was written by a lady. She's a, she and her husband are career missionaries in Tanzania. And her blog article, what spurred it was she had heard all the talk uh, about if this particular candidate is elected, I'm moving to Canada. And so she's responding to that. She started out just talking about how, well, she wasn't going to move to Canada. It was way too cold and joking about it. But then she dug in and she said, maybe it's time for American Christians to start living like missionaries in their own country. And it's a fascinating perspective she gives and I know, you know, from early on in, uh, as children, you know, you've been told, we're all missionaries. Well, we are all missionaries. We are all supposed to tell, wherever we are, all the time, whatever we're doing, we're supposed to tell people about Jesus. But living as a missionary in a foreign country, she gives this perspective. And I want to read a couple of paragraphs to you from her blog. She says, uh, this is my life. I live in a country that's not mine. But I'm living in Tanzania as a, a long-term resident, so I care about what happens here. I prayed during the election. They had a big election last year. I prayed during the election. I follow the news. I rejoice with their successes, and I hurt for their losses. But this is not my country. I don't expect my political opinion matters much, and I'm not surprised if I experience animosity. I don't expect to have many rights. I do expect to feel like an outsider. I don't expect businesses and government agencies to value the same things I do. I might be limited in the kind of work I can do here because my values are different, but that's okay because my goal isn't to get rich or to be safe or to build my career. My goal is to further the gospel. So I expect that I'm not going to be comfortable all the time. I'll have to make sacrifices of comfort and convenience for the sake of God's work. I try to loosen my grip on my possessions, knowing that my stay here is just temporary. The one thing she settles is, I, I want to leave a mark for Jesus while I'm here. Here's how the writer of Hebrews said it. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Uh, literally uh, alien residents who have no rights as citizens. This world was not their home. And that's how these people of faith lived in relationship to their world. Now, that doesn't mean that they disengaged. Uh, plenty of Christians today are saying, this world is so messed up, it's so twisted, it's so far into my belief system, I'm just going to pull back and I'm going to get me and my family and I'm going to take care of them. Maybe the poster child for how they want to live life is uh, Noah. They say, I'm going to take care of me and my family and I'm just going to wait for God's wrath to come raining down on the rest of this world and destroy them all and I'm going to really kind of enjoy the idea. Is that how Noah did it? Did Noah just say, hey, I'm taking care of me and mine and the rest of the world... Well, it's just going to be pretty rough when God comes, uh, comes in his wrath upon them. That's not really how, how Noah did it. Here's what the Bible says. Again, it's good to know what the Bible says. In 2 Peter, here's what it says about Noah. God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah. A herald of righteousness. Some of your translations of that verse will say, a preacher of righteousness with seven others. And he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. 
Noah lived his life. He did what God told him to do. He built that ark. And the whole while he was doing it, he was pointing. This is who God is. This is what right relationship, righteousness. This is what right relationship with God and other people looks like. This is how you should live. And it was an unresponsive generation he, he preached to. Yet he reached out to them and was a herald of God in his generation. He cared about his work. How about Moses? We're going to move on down through chapter 11. Moses, by faith, this is uh, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Moses could have rolled right along. This is a pretty good life. I've got privilege, I've got position, there's some power associated with this. Things are rolling okay for me. Maybe I can love God and still keep my foot, not a, dipping a toe in the culture around me and enjoy that part of it too. But instead, he stood with the people of God in obedience to God, even if it cost him all that position and privilege and wealth and power, even if it cost him everything, because he was looking toward the eternal. Rahab, this is uh, verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they'd been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, your translation may say Rahab the harlot, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So here's Rahab. She's lived her life in, in Jericho. It is a really, really sinful place. In fact, when, when the walls fell, the people are going to conquer Jericho the ban was on, and the ban meant you can't take plunder from the city. This is a wealthy city, a powerful city. Even down to the stuff in the city is so sin-stained, you don't want to mess with it. And, and, and so this is the city she lives in. Now, she's in a pretty good position. She actually lives in the city. These cities weren't overwhelmingly large uh, as far as population that lived in the city. They would come into the city when they were being attacked, so they'd be in the, behind walls, but she's actually living in the city. Her house is on the wall. So she's doing pretty well for herself. She's caring for the rest of her family, as the Bible describes it. So here is, uh, here's Rahab. And instead of, instead of saying, I'm going to do all I can to hang on to what I've got here, she cashed out. and She protected the spies that Joshua had sent to look at the city. And she gave up all of that and her people so she could walk with the people of God into the land of promise because she, she saw something beyond today. She looked on to eternal things. And she's a woman of faith. She's described as a great woman of faith. Matthew 1 tells us she's the great-great-grandmother of King David. That's pretty good, uh, pretty good for Rahab the harlot. She's in that bloodline, and then that makes her also in the bloodline of Jesus Christ, the Savior. In the last part of verse 33, it reminds me of my favorite example of this kind of living. It's, uh, it's that little phrase in verse 33. as It's describing, there are a lot more of these folks. There's a lot more heroes of the faith out there. Who, and it describes, one of shut the mouths of lions. Okay, shut the mouths of lions. Who are we talking about? Taryn, who are we talking about? Thank you, Daniel. You guys. Everybody's a coward. I'm glad Taryn stayed in the second service so he could answer some questions today. Talking about Daniel. Now, he actually served his whole adult life. Remember Daniel's story. He's just a kid and an evil Babylonia led by an evil king named Nebuchadnezzar. They come in and they take the best and the brightest out of Jerusalem and haul them off to captivity in Babylon. That was one of the first times they come in. They're going to do it a couple more times. The last time they're just going to destroy Jerusalem. Well, they come and they, they see, here's this young guy. It looks like he has potential. And they put him in a leadership training program in Babylon. And he prospers in that environment. In a pagan, a pagan empire under a pagan king. And he, he grows up in this environment, and he serves. He serves in the government in, in different ways. Sometimes he's right up front in big, uh, big visible places. 
and often he's just a he's a government bureaucrat in a cubicle way back a cog in the mighty Babylonian empire he serves with multiple kings and godless people over time and and while he he seeks to benefit the people to bless his city he's not from there this is not his home. He answers to God first. He lives for God always. He speaks God's truth whenever he has opportunity. He does not belong to Babylon. And again, he supports his country. He prays for its king. All the things that the scriptures say that he should do. He serves his generation to make life better for others. But he belongs to God because his eyes are on the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. Jeremiah was one of his contemporaries in Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah tells the people who are in captivity in Babylon, seek the welfare of the city in which you live. Godless? Pagan? Seek the benefit of the city where you live because that's where you are. Just remember, that's not who you are because you belong to God. The Bible, this is a tough one, for folks, but the Bible, I have looked through and through and through, and the Bible never says, God so loved the United States of America. You know, we don't actually show up in this book. I know that's a sad uh, rebuttal to a lot of what we'd like to believe, but we are not the centerpiece of the plan of God for the ages. We are blessed. We have so much. The Bible says God so loved the world. The temptation for Christians in an election year is to place all of our hopes in a person or a party or a platform rather than the person of Jesus Christ. We have, and this could make me different than some of the people that have talked about this, we have for 50, 60 years as a country and as Christians living in this country somehow come to the conclusion that the best thing we can do for this country is to elect the right people to office, and that's what's going to make this place more Christian. And that's what's going to protect uh, our faith here. And our track record in that is that we have lost ground over and over and over again because as the people of God, we put our faith in a political process instead of the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're in the mess we are in today. We have, we have so combined, here's our Christianity and here's the United States and somehow we think they're the same thing. They are not. One of my favorite quotes about this says this. Mixing Christianity up with a political party, I know a lot of people have jumped in, even this year, jumped in big on this. Mixing Christianity with a political party is like trying to mix ice cream with horse manure. <laughs> I'm not done. It doesn't do much damage to the manure, but it sure messes up the ice cream. <laughs> Christianity becomes toxic when we lose track of Jesus. Now, we have to remember that our deepest allegiance is not to a candidate, it's not to a party, but to Christ. Our politics are not primarily shaped by a donkey or an elephant, but by the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It, it's not about right or left. It's about being centered always and, and faithfully on the person of Jesus Christ. You know, I can only imagine what would happen if Christians in America took their allegiance to Christ more seriously than their commitment to, to the candidate or the party or the country. Now, I love my country, and I'm faithful to my country, but I will trade this country in a second for Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to compromise him for the sake of this land. You know, there's a beautiful old hymn. Words go like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And not on anything else but that. You know, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And there's a lot of sinking sand these days. And so, I just say, let's stand firm on our commitment to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. In this, and, I'll, and I'll preach a couple more times on, as we lead up to this election. Because I think there's some things that are 
really shifting in our country that are going to make being a Christian in this land a whole lot different than it has ever been before. We're already feeling that in multiple layers, in multiple places. Uh, there, there's some legislation floating around out there right now, like in California, where Christian schools are being denied the right to be uniquely Christian. They have to compromise all their Christian stuff because they're receiving federal funds. The government is, is pushing them to give up their Christian foundations. And that passes there. It's going to flow across the country quickly. So there's some things like that that it's going to be different than it's ever been. We're going to have to think about this differently than we've thought about it before. Here's what we do. What did Jesus say? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Absolutely. But render to God the things that are God's. And we hold both of those things uh, in tandem. We're going to pray. We need to pray for our nation's leaders. Pray for this election process. We need to participate as God gives us opportunity. We need to care for our city. Care about it at all levels. Listen, uh, there's so much at local levels and state levels that we just pass right over. There's so much big stuff that is, is so vital to, uh, to our Christian faith and our freedoms. Uh, we don't want to compromise by just thinking a president's going to fix it all. I say to you as followers of Jesus Christ, you're going to be okay in this election year. You're going to be okay. Uh, two of those news stations that I watched this morning told me my life was coming to an end because of this election cycle. I don't really believe that's true because the Bible tells me something different than that. I'm going to be okay. Now, uh, probably six months ago, I, I, I got these words going through my head, and it's something I rehearse on a regular basis. And every time I start feeling my fear outstripping my faith, uh, this is something that's just been a good anchor for me. Maybe it's helpful for you, maybe it's not. But it's it's th these words. And really, all I know is I'm not home yet. This is, this is not where I belong. You can take this world, give me Jesus, because this is not where I belong. Now, I said those words to you, but in my head I always sing them. I spared you that because I'm full of grace today. <laughs> but I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask our music folks to come up here, because if I've got backup singers, uh, we're going to sing this song. And this is... Part invitation, most of the invitation is just a commitment to, to recognize it's not just about here. It's got to be about there. All I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I belong. Take this world and give me Jesus. This is not where I belong. I'm a citizen of two lands, but my primary citizenship is in heaven.